Dr. Allison Miller, who is the, co the founder and owner of the Dissertation Coach. Um, she has worked with faculty and students across the nation on navigating and getting through the dissertation. And she will be here with us today giving us all insight on how we can successfully get through graduate school. So um, without further ado, Allison. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Uh, again, my name's Allison. You don't have to call me Dr. Miller but I used to work at a hospital where they called me Dr. Allison. Um, I actually um, am so glad to be here because um, I've been doing dissertation coaching, which I'm not sure if you've ever heard of before. It's, it's, it's something I kind of made up, but now there are a whole bunch of people who are doing it along with me. Um, I lived in Chicago for 18 years, and that's where I got, my, I got my PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and promptly after that opened my business. And two years ago, I moved to L.A., so I've had a two, two, almost two-year drought of doing dissertation workshops, which is really one of my favorite things to do. So I'm really glad to be here with you today. And my intention for today is to offer you ideas and wisdom, and I think most importantly, a way of looking at yourself and the graduate school experience that maybe you haven't heard before. Um, I know in graduate school there's a lot of focus on doing the work, right, taking the classes, doing the master's thesis, do you have, what do you call it here, qualifying exams, comprehensive exam, qualifying, or comp exams, making it through the dissertation process. But there's often very little conversation of candor about what it is actually like on the interior of doing a PhD. What goes on in our minds, in our emotional life, and how we actually manage the process of doing a dissertation. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of a sense of how on earth does someone decide to become a dissertation coach, because that's a very, kind of a strange choice of a career. Um, when I went to graduate school, I started graduate school in 1994. Fortunately for me at that time, I know this is going to sound strange, but I did not have an internet connection. I know that you're like, what? But I didn't, you didn't have internet at home. So I, I, I always joke that I might still be in grad school if I had. I really don't know how you do it. Um, my email address was like u50603 at uic.edu, and I checked it like once every other week. I, and I remember the first time I sent an attachment. It was so exciting. So it was, it was a little bit of a different world for me. I actually had to go to the library and take books like journal volumes off the shelf and Xerox them at a machine with dimes. I am not kidding. So, uh, but even though I think technology and many things have improved the lives of graduate students, I think that we, the struggles that we experience are the same. When I was a, a, a graduate student, the first big ticket item I had to complete was a master's thesis. Um, obviously, I had classes along the way. And I was a very serious procrastinator. You, do any of you know what I'm talking about? OK. So um, what I used to do is um, in the early 90s, MTV had a show, The Real World. I have no idea if that's still on anymore. I actually moved to California, and I have no idea where MTV even is in my channel lineup. But I've heard there's no point because they actually don't play music anymore. Anyway, The Real World, when it first came out, was this like very interesting kind of like social commentary. It eventually devolved into like debauchery and hookups and whatever else they were doing. But at the time, they put together this compilation of people, and I found it from almost like an anthropologist fascinating. But unfortunately for me, MTV played um, marathons, where they would do the same show, you know, like half hour after half hour, OK? So just to give you a sense of what it was like. I lived in a basement apartment. In Chicago, we call them garden apartments. But really, it means you're living, you don't have basements here. But if you've never, if you can imagine living in a basement with windows, so it's depressing. And my office had no windows. It had no internet. That was a good thing. But it had no windows. So I would get up in the morning with these grand intentions. And I am guessing for some of you, now um, let me ask just as a little bit of a tangent, how many of you are going into your first year of graduate school right here, just so I can see? OK, a few, OK. How many of you are going into like second, third year, kind of master's level, thesis level, OK? And how many of you are more at the exam phase? OK, a few of you. And who is actually at the dissertation phase, just so I can see? OK. Now, just to keep it simple, I'm going to use the term dissertation a lot, but really every single thing I talk about is completely relevant to all of you. Okay? So I would embark on a weekend that might be familiar to you. You know how during the week sometimes you don't get a lot done? So then you tell yourself what? I'm going to work all weekend. Have, has anyone, is anyone like actually planning that already? Who's going to all weekend, weekend work? All right, okay. Here's what happens. 
You get home Friday night. Oh, look, Time Magazine came. Oh, I'm hungry. But, you know, grad students don't like to eat alone, so our best friend is what? The TV. So we turn on the television. We're eating our dinner. We get into a show. Okay, I'm going to start working at 8 o'clock, right? Some of you are law and order addicts in this room. I know it. Okay, especially if you're a woman, they're more likely. Well, whatever your show is that you watch, the next thing you know, it's 8.30. Oh, it's almost 9. You know what? I'm tired. <laughs> I'm going to get up Saturday morning, and I'm going to work all weekend. Okay, so then you get up on Saturday morning, and your place is kind of a mess, right? But before you deal with that, you go to the computer, and what is the first thing you do? Every time, you check your email. By the way, I would actually like to do a little experiment. If your phone is out or near you, okay, I'm going to ask you to do something. Put it under your seat or in your bag. I know, some of you might start jonesing right here. What do you mean? But this is crack that is interfering with your graduate school experience. I know, because I have the addiction. Watch. Let's see. Who checked my email? Ooh, let's go on Facebook. This is a really bad discovery that I came up recently, is that there's a Facebook app. That's not good for someone like me. <laughs> Some of you need to delete the Facebook app off your phone. No, I'm sorry, no more solitaire. Angry Birds, bye-bye. Because some of you are constantly avoiding your work, right? So you might not be watching television, but you're playing video games or you're doing whatever your vice is, okay? So you check your email. Next thing you know, you're on the Internet, surfing. You're on YouTube watching videos of cats stuffing themselves into little boxes in Japan or whatever you're, right? People who like fell off the pier and laughing hysterically. Watching people put Mentos in Diet Coke and throwing them off buildings and exploding. I mean really, almost anything is more appealing sometimes than doing our work. Okay, so finally you get away from the computer and you start to kind of clean up. I bet you've got laundry to do. So, but you've got to go down to 7-Eleven and get some quarters, right? And then you do your laundry. And then it's 2 o'clock and you start thinking about your plans for the night. You know what? I'm just going to get up Sunday, and I'm going to work all weekend, rest of the weekend, right? Okay, so you get up on Sunday. Can you tell me the honest truth? What time do you start working on Sunday, for real? Real. Right, Tuesday, right? Because <laughs> you're going to work all weekend. No, you're not. No one's going to work all weekend. And we're going to talk in a little bit about why that is. What is the challenge of actually moving our energy into the work? Right? So there's you, and then there's the work you plan to do. But we really don't know a lot about, as human beings, how do I actually get myself to cross the threshold and do the work at hand? Whatever that work is, whether it's a paper that's due for a class, it's actually your dissertation or something else. Now, have you noticed that when you, for your research jobs, your teaching jobs, you get that work done before your own work? Right, because there's a sense of accountability to someone else. And that's one of the problems, is that we often don't really have much accountability for the day-to-day -day experience of graduate school. Now, ultimately, there is accountability. That if you don't do the work, one day you won't get your degree. Or you'll fail a class, or there'll be consequences. But on a typical day-to-day -day experience for a graduate student, there's really very little accountability. So now, I was one of those people that was doing her all weekend weekends of work, but was really starting at you know, 6 o'clock on Sunday. And the truth is, I was pretty miserable the whole weekend because I was feeling guilty. So even though I was watching TV, going out with friends and doing things, I wasn't really getting anything out of it because the whole time I was feeling awful about my lack of productivity and beating myself up. And so one day after like, I had overdosed on the real world and finally forced myself to get over to the computer and start typing, I was actually working on my master's thesis. I still don't understand how I even got to this place with my master's where I was writing up the results, but I was there somehow. So I'm in my windowless room typing. And then I have this moment where the next thing I know, I'm in the hallway, headed to the fridge, eyeing the remote, right? And I remember very clearly thinking, wait a minute, how did I get here? I had no memory of stopping working and getting up and, and, and moving. Now, some of you, you don't have to, now for you, you don't actually have to get up. You just do it right at your computer, right? Do, do some of you actually leave your email open while you're working? Yeah, yeah, a lot of you do. That's the death of you. That makes it so difficult, and I know that it's really hard to break that habit. And we're going to talk a little bit about, do you guys know about tomatoes, the Pomodoro technique? Okay, I'm gonna, if you don't know it, I'm going to teach it to you today. It is really amazing to use. Okay. So um, I, that moment for me really was the epiphany, if someone can have a moment in their life, that, would, that led to me even being here today. Because in that moment, I realized that what had happened was it had gotten hard. 
I didn't know what to write. I felt stupid. And so I started moving away from the painful experience of maybe I'm not smart enough to do this and move into procrastination mode. And that's when I realized that there was a possibility that I could feel that way and still have the courage to move forward and do the work. And that really gave birth to a whole shift over time in my approach to my work. And now I've been doing dissertation coaching for 12 years. Um, I've thought very deeply about how do we get ourselves to do what matters. So today, in today's workshop, I'm going to cover kind of three main arenas. Um, I want to talk about the healthiest mindset that you can have in graduate school so that you can really prosper while you are here at USC. And when I talk to you about the mindset, I want you to know there's a part of me that grieves that I did not know these things when I was in your shoes. So I hope that you really will take it in and contemplate it and think about it and discuss it with your peers after I leave. Um, I also want to talk with you about structure and accountability. Now, there's a little bit of an issue, which is that we don't, for some reason, actually have handouts here. They may be coming. If they come, it may be insufficient for all of you. Now, did you get them in an email? Do any of you actually have them with you or on a computer? A few of you. OK. So if we don't have them, we will make up something else. And then you'll have an example to look at later. If we do get them, you're going to need to snuggle and get up close to each other and probably share, because I don't think we're going to have enough. But I want you to be able to follow along an example. And I want to start to teach you how do you use a project management approach to the dissertation that will support you week to week and day to day. And then the third area I'd like to discuss with you is how do you overcome the very common psychological barriers that students experience during the master's and doctoral journey so that you can have the capacity to do what matters day to day. Now, you're not going to be perfect at it. You're still going to struggle sometimes. You're still going to procrastinate or fall into a perfectionistic trap. But at least you'll have some ideas of how you can start to move out of those things. Okay, so let's begin with talking about minds, the, the healthiest mindset. And that has a couple of components that I'd like to discuss. Okay, so first of all, I think one of the most important things in graduate school in terms of the foundation of your experience is that you stay in contact with why you chose this path in the first place. Why are you here? What matters to you? See, you didn't, listen, you did not choose to come here because you want to become a millionaire, I'm guessing for most of you, right? I know, you know, maybe. You could have gone to Wall Street. You chose to get a doctoral degree or master's degree in some field. You came here because you had some kind of a commitment. You want to be of service in some way. You want to innovate. You want to create. You want to teach and impact the youth. You want to reach out in the community. You want to create interventions. You want to create a medical breakthrough. Right? There are things that you care about of why you came here. And sometimes in graduate school, in fact quite often, we can lose contact with why we really are here. And what starts to happen is we start to focus more on how can I look good and look smart and prove myself and survive this experience than on really living out our values and allowing this experience to be profound in our life. See, I'm someone who definitely survived graduate school. I hope for you that you can thrive in graduate school. And there's a very key ingredient to that. You have to be willing to not know. You have to be willing to struggle. You have to literally be willing to say, I don't know. See, there's a curious thing that happens to graduate students, which is that we come to graduate school as, we're called students, by the way, which means that we're students, we're apprentices, we're learning. But somehow, some way, we start to feel like, I should know this already. Or like, for example, let's say you're taking a statistics class, and you're really struggling to understand regressions. You know how like, you keep pretending like you understand, but you really don't? I mean, yeah. So then when you go on to the next thing, you're missing some basic skills because you've got this whole story that I should have understood the first time, and I shouldn't be struggling with it. That must mean I'm not smart. So I can't dare say that I don't know something. Say it. Speak up. I don't know. I don't understand. I need help. Because that's how you make this experience a profound learning experience. Let me tell you something. People who already know are unavailable for learning. People who don't know and can say, I don't know, that's when learning can take place. And that's why you're here. You're actually here to learn. So I just want to really encourage you, 
to keep reminding yourself, I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. And part of learning and growing means falling down, struggling. Maybe you get some negative comments on a paper, or you don't do so well on an exam. That's part of the process. We get so focused in our culture on the product, on perfection, on having everything look really good, and we forget about the process and the journey along the way. And there's a big difference between process and product, okay? So I just want to show you an example. Now, I wrote a book called Finish Your Dissertation Once and For All, and I actually have a gigantic, massive bin of paper that I moved from Chicago to LA, even though my husband was like, why are we moving all your old drafts of your dissertation book? You wrote the book. And I said, because I want to always be able to remember the process. So I pulled out just a tiny, this is like one two hundredth of the stacks of paper that I have. I, I really, I use a lot of trees to write this book. And I was really struck when I flipped through it today, and what I found was a page this is a page where I'm talking about the project management approach. I struggled with this opening. I wrote it, and I rewrote it, and I rewrote it. And I look, and I see I got to a point I crossed out every single sentence on the page. And, there's a, there's, and that whole thing became three sentences. I cro you can't see some of the back see, but literally, except for doable and less likely to procrastinate. That's it. Every single other word on this page is crossed out. It just was like humble and reminded of the process is that you're going to write, and you're going to have to scrap the whole thing. But you couldn't get to what you were going to actually say unless you said it that old way the first time. I know you read articles, you do your research, you study, and you may want it to pour out of you, right? Some of you have that fantasy, right? Anne Lamott, who wrote a wonderful book called Bird by Bird, she talks about how we have this fantasy that after you kind of stretch your fingers and kind of get the cricks out of your neck, you're going to sit down and type like as fast as a court reporter. And you're just going to be like, bound, she says, huskies bounding along the snow. And she describes that that is the fantasy of the uninitiated. And what she says, I'm going to use a curse word, so don't get upset, okay? Because I'm quoting Anne Lamott, it's okay. She says, the only way I get anything written at all is to write really, really shitty first drafts. You have to be willing to write crap. Okay, one of my clients, you know, a lot of my clients in, in their plans will say things like crappy first draft, shitty first draft, to remind them to lower their standards. And about a year ago, one of my clients said to me, you know, I'm really tired of calling my work crap. So she came up with a new term that I really love. It's called a baby draft. <laughs> a baby draft. You know, babies have, listen, I have two kids. Let me tell you, they don't walk before they sit up, right? First, they've got to kind of like roll over and they sit up. And they start to crawl, and they start to cruise around the house, right? Then they eventually get up and walk, and then they run. And then there are suddenly almost 12-year-olds who are asking me how long until they can get their belly buttons pierced, right? <laughs> That's what happens. Anyway, not quite that fast. But there's a process and a trajectory to writing. But when we lose sight of I'm here to learn, we get caught up in the idea that I should be able to just sit down and have this pour out of me, or this should be above criticism. That's not why you're here. You want that critique. You want people to say, hey, your argument's not strong. Hey, there's an issue with your experiment. I'm concerned about the way you did this linear regression. You want people to speak up and raise their voice so you can keep learning, learning, learning. It's really important that we continually remember that our worth as a human being is separate from our performance. And where a lot of us get into trouble is we constantly confuse performance with worth. Dignity is something that is inherent to who you are as a human being, okay? In my, uh, dignity is something that's actually interesting. I did my, ma my master's and dissertation on the topic of dignity. I studied how the experience of homelessness affects dignity. So it's something I've thought a lot about and very, very passionate about. Your dignity, your value as a human being exists separate of what happens while you're here at USC. Don't lose sight of that. Because if you lose sight of that, you'll get confused into thinking that this is about how well you perform. I know you want to excel and I know what you want to learn. I am much more interested though in what you learn while you are here than how good your grades are, how fantastic your dissertation is. What did you learn? What wisdom did you create? Have you met people in your life who have lots of knowledge, they have lots of facts, they constantly are telling you about all their facts, but they're not very wise? See, wisdom is what's going to get you much, much further. So, 
I just want to encourage you to soak it in while you're here. Don't miss it like I did. Don't miss the time when you were here to have conversations with faculty. Find out what people are doing, you know? And by the way, also, you have the right to say no. You don't have to say yes and get involved in every single project that comes your way. Have some boundaries so that you can really focus on the things that matter most to you. Now, part of having a really healthy mindset also has to do with something essential, which I managed to get a PhD in clinical psychology and never hear about. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. Carol Dweck is a researcher. She's up at Stanford. She's a social and developmental psychologist. Her research is brilliant. Um, when you look at the handouts or when they arrive, are they coming? Do you have a few? Okay, so we'll, we're going to creatively spread them throughout and we'll figure it out, okay? Um, her, uh, and when you, if you go, uh, where, how did they get the information on the handouts? Was it was emailed to them or it's on Blackboard? Some of them is emailed electronic copy. Okay, and okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, then we're going to be fine. Okay, so I might have to do a little song and dance till the rest of them get here. Okay, so, um, but the, when I talk about Carol Dweck, I put the reference in there and there's some information about her. Don't worry, and don't feel like you have, don't even feel like you have to frantically take notes right now. Trust that the things that you need to hear today, you're going to hear. Now, feel free to take notes, but I'd rather you be here and hear me than lose me because you're trying to record everything I'm saying. Um, and some of you learn, by the way, by taking notes, so that's okay. Some of you need to doodle while I'm talking or you can't pay attention. I get that. Everybody learns a little bit differently. Carol Dweck's research, I think, is vital. In fact, if I were running a graduate school, I would have every single student uh, read her work. If you email me, I will email you and tell me, send me the Carol Dweck article. I have a really great article that summarizes her work in a few pages called Beliefs That Make Smart People Dumb. Okay? What her research shows is that what matters more than how intelligent you are is what you believe about intelligence. Now get that, okay? What matters more than how intelligent you, you, know, you are today, if I were to test you on an IQ test, is actually what you believe about intelligence. That matters more. Okay, so what do I mean? Carol's research, and she studied kids, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, um, and also often look at the, when students were making the transition. So some of you are making a transition into graduate school right now. Or some of you are making a transition from being a master's to a doctoral student. Some of you are transitioning into that kind of what's going to be next. I'm going to be finishing my dissertation and what's next in my career. The beliefs I'm going to talk about now also particularly matter when it comes time to make transitions. Transitions are often where uh, students start to struggle. There are two key beliefs that human beings have about intelligence. Usually we have one or the other or maybe some kind of a mixture. All right, so let's take it back to the lab. Let's imagine we're in the lab with uh, Carol Dweck, okay? So let's pretend I took, it probably would be more than 50% of this room. I took you with me into the lab and I gave you a series of puzzles and exam uh, questions and problems that you had to work through. And over time, for this, let's pretend it's like this side of the room, those problems and uh, questions and puzzles are going to become more difficult, okay? If this half of the room has what's called a fixed mindset, what's going to happen is that as the problems and puzzles become more difficult, you're going to begin to lower your effort. You're going to begin to move away, avoid, make excuses. So children in this situation would start saying things like, you know, I just, I'm kind of bored of this. Is my mom here yet? I just kind of, I, my head hurts. They would start making excuses, start lowering their effort. They have this fixed mindset. And what a fixed mindset is, is where we believe that intelligence is a fixed entity. It's the entity theory of intelligence, where I believe that intelligence is something that cannot be changed, right? Yeah, I might be able to pick up a few more skills. But, and I actually think psychology has done a disservice to humanity uh, with intelligence testing. The original way intelligence testing was conceived of by Binet in France was not to assign you with an IQ store, score as if that's how intelligent you are and you are forever, but rather as a way to identify children in the French school system who weren't being adequately supported by the school where the school needed to change. But now we've come to believe that I have an IQ score and very often we believe it's finite and that's it forever. If you believe in the fixed mindset, if you believe in this finite or this entity theory of intelligence, the preoccupation in life becomes proving that you're smart because you can't change it. 
You have to keep proving that you're smart enough, that you have enough of this fixed entity called intelligence. Does that make sense to everybody? So what happens when we have a fixed mindset is we become preoccupied with looking smart. Now, if we just go back and rewind on what I was talking about earlier, how can you really focus on learning and open yourself to learning and to why you're really here if you're preoccupied with looking smart, if you're preoccupied with looking good, proving yourself, and surviving this experience? See, people with a fixed mindset start to orient themselves around performance, and their goals are around performing. Now, something very detrimental happens as a consequence of the fixed mindset. The detrimental thing is, is that students will often bypass opportunities to grow their skills if, they, if it feels too risky. They think, if I, oh, I might look stupid there. Oh, I might not be able to perform well. Oh, I might not do so well. I'll just, I'll just say no to that and go over here. So they'll actually miss out on learning opportunities because they want to save their sort of identity and image as being an intelligent person. And they'll engage in self-handicapping behavior, like procrastinating and putting things off, so that at least when they don't get a good grade on a paper, they can say it was because they put it off to the last minute, not because they weren't smart enough. So it can actually have a very profoundly detrimental impact on your experience. And you see in the handouts, I'm actually, where I talk about in a lot of details when you get to them, um, what actually happens as a consequence. Um, now, with a fixed mindset, the tendency is to feel smart, worthy, and capable when you perform well. So have you noticed sometimes you perform well and sometimes you don't perform as well? Right? Remember, I'm actually inviting you start to consider that performance and worth are operating independently. Very often we piggyback worth on performance. Your performance is going to go is going to be a roller coaster ride in graduate school. I know it'd be fun if it could always be on the upswing. But the truth is you're not always going to succeed. Now, what happens is that there are some people, let's pretend we had this part of the room over here, who come into the lab and I give you the same thing, I give you the same problem sets and the same puzzles and questions and they increase in difficulty over time. You have a very different response to failure. This group lowers their effort when they start to fail or struggle. This group comes alive. They say, awesome, I'm going to get smarter. This is really tough. It's going to really challenge me. Can I take this home? They're going to want to study it, engage in it, have conversations about it. They have what's called a growth mindset. Okay? A growth mindset is where you believe that intelligence is malleable, that with effort, persistence, hard work, conversation, struggle, trying again, trying again, and trying again, you will eventually figure it out, that you can actually get smarter. And so the interior dialogue of a person with a growth mindset sounds very different. They're not asking, how can I look good? They don't actually care. They're not interested in if you think they're smart or not. All they care about, or primarily what they care about, is how can I learn, how can I grow my abilities, how can I get better? Now, I know in, uh, I, I live in Chicago while the Bulls were like the reigning kings. Oh, by the way, here's the hilarious thing about living in Chicago. Okay, so the Bulls won, I don't know, I don't even know, like three years in a row, then Jordan was gone for like a year or two, they didn't win, and then he came back and they won. Literally, the next year after Jordan was gone, I remember saying, oh, it's basketball season? Like, you wouldn't even know we had a basketball team after Michael Jordan was gone. But I bring him up because I think we tend to worship him as somebody who has this incredible, innate athletic ability. I'm not saying he didn't have any of that. But you know what he had that was different than most basketball players? He practiced. He practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced more than you could possibly imagine. That's what sets him apart. We love to believe in the idea of the prodigy. Okay? And I know there are some of them out there. And there are people, listen, my husband decided he was going to take a pottery class. It is incredibly annoying to my friends to see, are you kidding me? He is throwing the most unbelievable things, lanterns and tea. He made two teapots, his first two teapots. He brought them home yesterday. They are incredible. It is true that this man has a natural prowess and sort of gift in this dire direction. His brain can make his hands do things that my, my brain cannot make my hands do. It's just the way it works. But that man is outside in our garage throwing pots every single day, growing, expanding, making mistakes, pots falling apart. 
he brought home something he invested probably 30 hours in, some of the paint came off the side. You know? So he is understanding that in order to develop mastery as a potter, he's probably going to have to dedicate 10 years of his life. Right? When you compare yourself, you read a journal article and you think, I could never write this. Well, first of all, that journal article was not written by the person whose author's name was on there. They got feedback from peer reviewers. They, there were editors. They had conversations with their colleagues. The truth is it took a village. When you compare yourself, your advisor can write a lit review out of, out of his or her head. Yeah, because they've been doing this for 20, 30 years. They have a long time on you. You don't know how to do that yet. So the growth mindset reminds us that we need to keep cultivating the faith and the belief that with, with effort, persistence, and hard work, I can actually get smarter. Intelligence is malleable. And there's incredible research now that shows how changeable the brain is, even into older age. You can grow, you can become much smarter, and I just, I wish I'd known that when I was in graduate school. I wish I hadn't spent so much time in fear of somebody finding out I wasn't smart, right? When I was in graduate school, this is what I believed. I'm not really smart. I just work hard. Some of you might know that thought, right? I just razzle-dazzle you with my capacity to be articulate. That's what I thought my one intelligence was in. I razzle-dazzle you, smoke and mirrors, so that you think I'm smart, but in truth I'm not. And despite the evidence, some of you have evidence of your intelligence, but you rationalize it. Oh, I just got lucky. I don't know why they gave me that fellowship. They must be crazy, right? right? So you, you come up with all the reasons. Listen, who cares how intelligent you are relative to the people in your program? It's irrelevant. We don't need to compete with each other. What we need to do is collaborate. That's what we need. The greatest accomplishments that come from human beings are almost always done in collaboration and supporting each other, encouraging each other, having conversations. Don't be afraid to not know. See, people with a fixed mindset, remember, they keep orienting their goals around performing well and looking good. Is that why you're here? Do you want to look good for five, six, seven years, four years? Whew. You should go do something else. Go, go try to be an actor and look good over there. You're in Hollywood, right? Instead, think about being able to orient your goals around learning, around growth, around expansion. And that can make a profound difference to you. Now see, motivation is actually the key ingredient in creative genius. Right? And let me read to you a definition of motivation. Motivation is the ability to commit to a valued goal. Commit to a valued goal. What, why are you... I want you to all leave here and think about, why am I here? What's the difference I want to make in the world? What do I want to innovate? What do I want to create? What do I want to express? What do I want to teach? What do I want to offer? What's the gift I'm going to leave the world with? Okay. One way to get in touch with what you value, by the way, I'm going to, this is a little morose, but I want you to imagine that it's your funeral. Okay? You, I don't know, you got hit by a bus. Okay? A USC bus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> People come to your funeral and they speak about you. What do you want them to say when they stand up and they speak about the kind of human being you were? Do you want them to get up and the first thing they say is, she was smart. Gosh darn it, she was intelligent. I don't think that's at the top of your list, is it? Right? What do you hope? Let me hear from you. What do you hope people will say about the kind of human being you were while you lived here on Earth? That you cared about others. What else? What? You add value? What was that? You were loving, right. Anything else? You were passionate, committed, generous. Anything, what else? Come on, why, why, why be here? Why live this life? What else would you want people to say about you? That you made a difference, yeah. See, a lot of times, if we actually studied your behavior day to day, it looks like what you care most about is being good enough and being smart enough and proving yourself. But actually, in your heart, what you really care about is being generous and making a difference and adding something contributing, having value. And the more that we're in touch with that, the more we can keep catching ourselves, by the way, you're going to catch yourself in the fixed mindset. Don't beat yourself up. Have a sense of humor. Okay? Um, now, let's speak just for a moment. I'm going to switch gears and talk about the project management approach. But I just want to talk a little bit about self-compassion. Okay? This is something that I am particularly passionate about because I think almost everything in our culture moves in the opposite direction of having compassion for ourselves. And part of being able to cultivate a growth mindset is we have to have compassion for the fact that sometimes we just really mess up. We don't do it right. We get negative feedback. We get criticized. Now, in our culture, 
uh, in Amer I think in American culture in particular, many of us were raised in environments where we were criticized on the athletic field, in the classroom, and in our homes, right? Get on the field! Where are you? Where's your head? You need to focus! Right? The coach would yell at you. Or your parents would say, what are you thinking? You, how on earth could you leave your room in this condition? I mean, did I raise you in a barn, right? Or you come home with bees and your mother or father say, what? We, we drilled, we studied, I cannot believe these are your grades. So what happens to us as we grow up is that motivation and criticism keep getting paired together. Motivation, criticism, motivation, criticism. What do you think happens to a human being that has those two things paired together? We start to internalize that the way you motivate yourself is with self-criticism. Do any of you do that? Let's just be honest. Who has ever, right? Can, what is it, can someone just tell me, just give a little flavor, what does it sound like? Just be brave. What does it sound like when you're criticizing yourself, to, to, to motivate yourself? You can do better than that, right? What else, what else do you say? You should work harder. You should work harder. Should is a really good word that we use a lot. You should, you should, right? Now, listen, when I talk about self-compassion, I don't mean what the Tibetan Buddhists talk about, which is idiot compassion, which is like, oh, you didn't feel like working? Well, let's go lay on the couch and have some candy. Okay, I don't mean that there's no accountability or that we don't pull ourselves forward or ask things of ourselves. But what we do is we wake up a benevolent spirit in ourselves, an encouraging voice. And by the way, interestingly... Uh, the research of Carol Dweck and the research of Kristen Neff, who are researching two completely different areas, I think in studying them both, have a little bit of an overlap. Okay? Because what Carol Dweck's research shows is that people with a growth mindset have an inner voice of encouragement that says, oh, come on, okay, all right, you didn't do so well at that. Okay, let's get back on the horse, let's try again, let's see if we can get another strategy, Ooh, who can we talk to? This constant inner dialogue of encouragement. Now, Kristen Neff, who's a professor um, at University of Texas, and she actually studies self-compassion, she wrote a fantastic book called Self-Compassion, says that when we start to develop self-compassion, it's like developing a voice inside ourselves that's constantly encouraging us, that's there for us, that's a friend to us, okay? Now, look, can I just pick on you for a minute? You don't have to say anything. Let's pretend you came to me and you said, Allison, I am really struggling with my dissertation. Could we meet for coffee? I'd love to get some tips and ideas from you. If I showed up and I spoke to you the way you speak to yourself, really like that critical voice, would you have coffee with me again? No, you wouldn't. See what I'm saying? Why would you think that the, that voice inside yourself that's so harsh and so critical is motivating when if I showed up and spoke to you that way, you, you might go on the internet and write what a terrible dissertation coach I am, right? <laughs> So we have to be mindful. Would I speak? Listen, if we spoke to our friends the way we speak to ourselves, we would have no friends. <laughs> so start paying attention to that inner dialogue that's accompanying you on your dissertation journey because that inner dialogue is shaping your daily experience and it is deeply impacting your ability to get to the work. We have to learn to befriend ourselves. Let me tell you, I think there's almost nothing more important, when I think about what I want to teach my kids, there's nothing more important that I want to teach them. How do you be there for yourself? How do you have a friendship with yourself and be there with you? Because everything else in life is sourced from that. I know today's workshop is called Navigating the Dissertation Process, but I hope that you also will recognize that we could have called this Navigating Life. Because these things are important, I think, in life beyond just getting the doctoral degree. And that's part of my intention every time I coach a student is that I hope they will learn things that will open their eyes to how they can live their life more successfully and how they can actually prosper. Um, now, before I move on to talking about the structure, are there any questions for me about what I was talking about in terms of this healthy mindset of being aware of our values and being aware of the, of the fixed and the growth mindset? Any questions? Yes. This mindset privileges uh, collaboration instead of competition, but actually the school encourages more competition. It's, uh, it's like the, the mindset of faculty is you have to be the best, and uh, so uh, yes, and they really worried about the product and not the process. Of this is yes, and this is an issue because oftentimes 
we are going to graduate school in an environment that's oriented more towards the fixed mindset. Can you feel that? Okay. Uh, the thing is, is that you have to decide for yourself what is important to me. I can't please everyone all the time. I can't be perfect. I'm going to strive to do excellent work that's aligned with my values, that's about creating, innovating, making a difference. But if, I, if all of my focus is on competing against you and you and you and being the best and looking good, the breakdown is, is that I'm not actually learning. My energy is getting sucked down a hole of being the best and looking good. Listen, a little healthy competition can be okay, but when we're constantly comparing ourselves this way and this way and this way, we lose sight of the bigger picture of why we're really here. It really actually doesn't matter that much what your neighbor is doing or not doing. It's not a meaningful comparison anyway. What matters is, am I here? Am I paying attention? Am I learning? Am I focusing? Am I getting the most out of my experience? And you know what? For some of you, that might mean that you don't end up being looking the best. The truth is, though, here's the reality. The reality is, is that the data shows that people who focus on learning outperform people who focus on performing. That's the bottom line. So the bottom line is, regardless of the message you're getting from faculty or anybody else, if you focus authentically on learning and growing, you're going to perform better anyway. And so that issue about how do I look in comparison to other people in some ways becomes moot. Um, I want to read you a quote that I, coincidentally someone sent me today that I just thought was very moving. It's by Marianne Williamson. She said, when we think of ourselves as channels for the infinite creative energy of the universe, we are lifted to higher thoughts than just how will I get a job. We are lifted to a realm of consciousness where thoughts like how can I best serve the world take precedence over lower questions, lifting us to levels where we naturally do get a job, we naturally do create money, and we naturally do produce the outer prosperity that reflects the prosperity in our hearts. That's a powerful question for you to ask yourself when I'm in graduate school, how can I best serve the world? Right? This is a, you are at a, a phenomenal institution with a smorgasbord of opportunities this, for learning. And I hope that you will really take advantage of it and allow the desire to serve the world in whatever way that manifests for you to, to take hold of you. Okay? Did you have a question? Absolutely. A lot of people are a mixture of both. Yeah, and I think oftentimes where this idea of the fixed mindset becomes the most sort of crippling is in response to like a negative feedback or like you, know, you can have this growth mindset and feel really encouraged and then as a response to like negative feedback or when you put something out and your performance is being judged, yes. you kind of can adopt that as like a negative. Um, it's like a, it's a defensive posture is what it is. I want to protect myself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm sure you do, but do you have any tips about Yes. Can we do a little quick little exercise to demonstrate? Okay. So I, I'm going to totally make up some criticism. Okay. Um, tell me your name. Angelique. Angelique? Yeah. Okay. Angelique, I, I'm really concerned about your conceptual framework. I mean, I just, I feel like it doesn't make any sense. I don't understand where your head is. I mean, wh what's going on here? Yeah. Okay. Now, so wh when I say that, there's the words I said, but can you just tell me, even though that may not be really relevant. But what 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 do you actually hear? Um, so I think probably like the things I would hear would be like, oh, I don't know how to do any better. I like didn't learn this properly. Maybe I'm an interloper. Like all that. Kind of Maybe they made a mistake letting me in the program. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> now, did I say any of those things? Did I actually say any of the things that she just said? I didn't. Okay. So one of the key things is we have to ground ourselves in the words that are being spoken and be able to distinguish the difference between the feedback that is being given. And by the way, many faculty get a failing grade in the delivery of feedback. No offense to any faculty. But they, I had a client once whose advisor wrote on the front of his chapter, stop wasting trees. <laughs> I don't think he went to advisor school, right? Or they write things like, clarify, expand. <laughs> Which is, I guess, better than critical, right? Well, if someone says to you, I'm concerned about your conceptual framework, 
The fixed mindset response is, I'm an interloper, I don't know what I'm doing, maybe I'm not cut out for this, I'm stupid, oh no. And we want to protect ourselves. Totally normal, natural response. Don't beat yourself up for it. That's, that may be what has to come up and work its way through you first. But then what I want you to do is keep reminding yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was actually said to me? What was actually said to me was I'm concerned about your conceptual framework. And there might have been sarcasm. There might have been an unnecessary tone in which that person spoke to you. See, different people, by the way, grow up in different tones, environments. Some of you in your intimate relationships have noticed that you have conflict about tone. That's because you, you grew up, with, somebody grew up like in a loud, obnoxious family where they, and they can't hear the tone that you hear. So sometimes advisors speak in a tone that you don't, you don't, you don't tune into that radio station. So you've got to like put the tone aside and say, okay, so they've got some issues with my conceptual framework. I guess I've got some work to do. Hmm. Instead of getting defensive, what if you got really curious? Huh. So what I hear you saying is that you've got issues with my conceptual framework. By the way, what I'm describing right now works very well in defense meetings. You use active listening. You say back what you're hearing. Well, tell me more about that. I'm really curious. Let's talk about the different issues. You dig in there and you investigate. And by the way, when you investigate critical feedback, oftentimes the feeling of it being so critical falls away. Because a lot of times people say things in a way that lands very poorly with you. You react to it. You go off into all your negative interpretations. You never are curious enough to go and find out what they really mean. And when you find out what they really mean, not so bad. Actually kind of helpful. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Okay. All right, so I want you to turn to page five. Hopefully your page five matches my page five. Okay, don't, don't read it yet, though. I know. I shouldn't have made you turn without, but I'm, let's, we're all going to exercise some impulse control. We're practicing right now. Okay, so every graduate student who works with me or one of the coaches on our team does some version of what I'm now about to teach you, and this is called project management. It's about... Um, actually structuring the dissertation process for yourself, or it could, be a, it, it could be exams, it could be master's thesis, it could be coursework, it could be other articles you're writing for publication. Listen, you could structure cleaning out your closet this way if you wanted to. So you can actually do it for a wide range of things. Now, when you come to graduate school, I mentioned earlier that you know that you need to do the work, but one of the hats that you wear that often is not visible to you and not, certainly not talked about is the role of being a project manager, another way of saying it could be energy manager, so that you have a certain amount of energy when you wake up in the morning, and you need to take that energy and actually move it into a variety of roles and responsibilities, one of them being actually doing your doctoral work. Okay, so in this phase, I'm going to mostly, again, use the term dissertation, but please know it can apply to almost anything. Um, and we often don't know, it's mysterious, how do I get myself to move my energy into the work? So I'll give you, I'm going to give you a metaphor now. We're, going to now. we're now moving into the metaphor phase of the workshop because I love metaphors and I will, I'm going to use a whole series of them. Okay. So when I was living in Chicago, um, I got the book contract for the book. And just to be totally honest, I spent the first six months not writing because I was terrified. I was imagining what people were going to write on Amazon. And I was so overwhelmed by how was I possibly going to write a book. Not to mention, to be perfectly honest, the book proposal I wrote was terrible. I don't know why they gave me a book contract. When I look back on it, I think, they must have been not sober. I mean, how, why? Why did they give me a book contract? It was terrible. Now, what I actually produce as a book, I think, is pretty good. It came a long way. Anyway, so I had this pretty terrible book contract. And I had to go through peer review. And they just uh, reamed me. They wrote terrible things about my book, the reviewers, but they still gave me a book contract and didn't even make me revise it. So I was pretty sure that, you know, they had made a mistake and I, there was no way I could do this. So I spent the first six months doing nothing. So I finally get myself to working, but I'm like halting and struggling and back and forth and I come out to California, to my parents live in Encino, to visit them. And at the time, my daughter was little, she was probably five and I had a, like a one-year-old baby. And um, my parents have a really beautiful backyard in Encino. They don't heat the pool. And um, they have a beautiful yard, very inviting. And um, I don't know if you've been around kids in a pool, but kids don't have nerve endings. They can just get right in the water, OK? But for me, getting in the water was very painful. And I just resisted it. And my daughter would be like, Mom, get in the pool. Mom, come on. We're, we're in California. We've got a pool. Get in the 
And I just resisted and resisted. So, you know, I would finally agree to go in the water, and this is what it looks like, okay? So, you know, there's steps, okay? Okay, now when you're a woman, you have to go. <laughs> Can you get to right here? Now, you know this. You have a choice. At this point, you're either going to get out or you're going to dive in because this is so painful. And so I would take a deep breath. I would kind of get all of my will back into one little package and dive in. And it was like painful for a few seconds, right? But then it was like oddly refreshing. And I would think, why did I do this when I could have just dove it in? Now, I have been to your apartment. You are doing this. You're checking your email. Oh, there's my outline. Oh, I'm going to do some research. <laughs> you know, when I was a first-year graduate student, I took a research methods class with my fellow first-year students. And the professor would go around the room and he would say, well, what did you do this past week? What did you do this past week? And you would say, I'm reviewing the literature. <laughs> oh, me too. I'm reviewing the literature. <laughs> We all know what that means, right? I did absolutely nothing since I saw you last. So you're, you're out there wading around in the water. You're on the periphery. Oh, I'm going to go get a snack and back out of the pool, okay? But it's a similar kind of transition, is that we have this resistance to crossing over the threshold sometimes into the work. Now, one of the reasons that you have that is because if I got out your calendar, and nobody has date, like day planners they write in anymore, do you? But maybe someone does. I was very resistant, but I switched over. But people write down, and they're all weekend weekends of work, by the way. Work on dissertation. I got a tip for you. This is a free tip. Cross it out and write, do nothing, because it's the same. You are not going to work on your dissertation this weekend. OK, now some of, you do the, some of you do the other thing. You go to the other end. You make a to-do list. In fact, you already have earned a PhD, by the way. You have a PhD in list making. You make your to-do list. You've got it all planned out. But there's a problem, which is that the person who made, is actually not, you didn't make the to-do list. Do you, know who, do you know who made your to-do list? Your anxiety. You know what I'm talking about? You know when you make that list where you know, really, there's no way this is going to happen, right? God would have to come down and part the Red Seas before you could do all of that work. It just is not going to happen. But you feel better. I know you make your little list. Some of you are sitting in class, by the way. You're so anxious, you're not even paying attention. You're making your list. You're surviving. Remember? You're here to learn, not to survive. So you keep making your to-do list and you keep making your to-do list. But the to-do list are missing something very important, and that's called reality. Okay? We make plans that are not humane. There's a difference between what you can do and what your mind tells you you should do. Your mind will trick you. No matter how many times I tell you this, the mind, my mind tricks me all the time into thinking I can do things or that I should do things that I really cannot do. So part of the process of structure and project management that we teach clients is starting to move to a model where we start to be more humane and more realistic about what we can actually accomplish. And that, that is very important because when you have uh, plans that require you to move 60 miles an hour and be frenetic and multitasking and doing a million things, and by the way, you cannot be on Facebook and email and write your dissertation at the same time. You know what's fascinating? They did this research at MIT with these like brilliant students, okay, who believe that they can multitask and learn. And they are convinced that they are actually more productive while they are moving between, you know, uh, social networking sites, email, texting, and their actual academic work. And they are, this, the scary thing is, they are 100% convinced that it is not affecting their learning in any way. Yet, in reality, the data shows that it is very seriously affecting their attention, their focus, and their intake. So I know that your mind may convince you that you can handle all of these modalities of technology and interaction with other human beings. Your mind is lying to you. There is really almost nothing a greater gift than to give yourself the gift of letting go of the other things. Okay? So anyway, let's go back to the pool for a second. Okay? So, I had this realization when I was in Los Angeles that I needed to start diving into the book writing, that there was this resistance, and I started to have this, I would do the same thing in my apartment. I'd go, okay, let's just dive in. I would turn off the email, turn off the distractions, and let myself focus, okay? 
Now, that worked. It was helpful. I still struggled a lot with procrastination. Um, and by the time I got to L.A. the next year, I was... I had made a lot of progress. The book was much, much closer to finishing, but I still had a bunch of work to do. Now, the pool was the same temperature as the year before, and my daughter still desperately wanted me to get in the pool. But I honestly, I think I must have aged in some way that I just could not get in the water. I, no matter what I did, no mental coaxing, I could not convince myself to get in the water. When my father came home, my father was working at Rand, and he came home and he said, oh, one of my coworkers told me this great idea. If you take hula hoops and you cover them in black garbage bags and float them in the pool, they're like solar panels. I don't think 10 seconds went by that I didn't grab the car keys and go to Target. I came home and I set up my experiment. I floated those hula hoops and garbage bags in the pool. The, the pool went up about 8 degrees in 48 hours. I got right in the pool. I didn't resist. I got right in the pool. So now without project management, without structure, you're trying to get up every day with a pool that's cold. Right? If your desk is a mess, your email's always open, your files are disorganized, right? you don't have any accountability, you're super stressed out, you're eating poorly, your phone is always on vibrate, do you think the pool is warm? Do you think it's ready for you to get in and get your work done? It isn't. So we have to start to pay attention to the factors in our environment, in our mind, our mindset, by the way, if we've got a fixed mindset, it cools off the pool. We have to pay attention to these factors that are cooling off the pool and making it so difficult for us to transition into the work because it is a transition. Sometimes you do just have to get yourself in there. It would help you also if you got together with friends more often, not to talk, but to actually work, if you felt like you were going to, you know, if, that's, if that will work for you. Many people, um, especially people who have struggled uh, keeping their attention and focusing, do better when they use the buddy system and they work around somebody else. Okay. Now, a very key way to warm up sort of dissertation or graduate school pool for yourself day to day is with structure and accountability. So structure is where you learn to break down the dissertation. I know this is not a newsflash and you all already know this. But you actually learn to break it down into meaningful chunks. One of the challenges of this though is that if you're someone whose anxiety shows up and starts planning for you, you need to involve someone else in doing this. And you have to learn to train yourself to plan what you can do versus what your mind tells you that you should do. Because planning what your mind tells you you should do will always backfire for you. So when I do structure with clients, we usually do two different levels. The second level, which I'm going to describe in a few minutes, in my mind, I actually believe is more important. But I want to go over this first level because for some of you, you need it. Some of you only need the second level, but some of you really need this first level. The first level is called a timeline. Timeline is where we start to map out over time what am I going to do by the end of each week. Now you can roughly say I want to have a draft of chapter one by the end of August and a draft of chapter two by the end of September. So you can, have, you can kind of rough in those kind of milestones. I think milestones that are a month out are usually meaningless for people. It's important to start to think through what's due by the end of this week say by Sunday, for example. By Sunday, June 24th, I am going to have a rough draft of the study participant and the measure section and the procedure section of my methods chapter. So you see how I, I broke that down into three pieces. So semantics are very powerful. If I write down draft methodology section, okay, that's decent, but it's still too big for most of us. It's very different to see three goals. By the end of this week, I want to have a draft of my measures, my procedures, and my study participants. And if that's too big for you, do less, okay? If you, if you need to read literature, specify which papers, which books are you going to read. Don't write down, read about social support. That is an instruction to take a nap, right? <laughs> You want to be very clear with yourself. See, when you wake up in the morning, if you have to spend your energy figuring out what you need to do, well, you're done. You're cooked because now your energy gets used up in trying to navigate and find your way. If you've already figured out what you're going to be doing week to week and day to day, you don't have to spend your precious energy finding your place again. You know the warm-up? You know what I'm talking about? When you have to, like, warm up again to the paper you're writing and find your place. Don't you hate the warm-up? The reason you have the warm-up is because you don't have structure. 
Structure helps eliminate the warm-up. The warm-up is such a waste of your time, too, by the way. Um, okay, so we're going to look at this. Um, now, this is a timeline that was created in a very particular context. It's also irrelevant to most of you in the, in the sense of, like, it's a clinical psychology dissertation. But you're going to get the concept from it, okay? But what's different for her is she was on a very tight timeline because she had to apply for an internship and she had to get it going. We did not create this whole timeline from start to finish as you see it here. We probably did about a month to a month and a half and then we developed it over time as time went on. But what you can see here is I want you to see how specific she's being. Okay, so let's start at the top. You see it says by June 26. She says by June 26. She already has a topic. She's been working on a particular research project at an institution. She knows what data she's going to use. She knows the measures. So she's already got a certain level of familiarity. If you're developing a topic, you'd have to back it up from here and do some of those preliminary steps. Her first thing is she's going to write down her research questions and give them to her advisor. Do you see how specific that is? It's got a beginning and end that are fairly close together. It's not a big amorphous goal like review the literature or write chapter two. Too big. Then she says, I'm going to create a very rough outline, we could call it a baby draft outline if we want it, of lit review. I'm going to determine the main substantive areas that I need to cover. And then she's going to modify her timeline once she does that. Sometimes your timeline has to be set up in a way where you're giving yourself instructions to find out more information so that you can plan more carefully in the future. So if you have to write a lit review, for example, figure out what are all the key substantive areas in the lit review. Do some outlining work. Then you take that outline and you say, okay, well, I'm going to guess it, to do a baby draft of this section one, it's going to take me about a week. All right, and then the second section is much more complex. It's probably going to take me about two weeks to baby draft that. Third and fourth section, pretty easy. I can do both those in the third week. So you start to actually map out the components of research you need to do over time in the weeks and you'll be very specific. Now, if you're conducting experiments, and you have no idea what you need to do beyond the next experiment, then just plan up until those experiments are done. Once the data comes in, did the experiment work? Okay, then you're going to have to go on a particular path like a flow chart. If the experiment didn't work, then you're going to have to learn from it and change course and go back and do something. You have to keep revising the plan. Timelines are living, breathing entities that require constant revision. Now, the way that I recommend putting together a timeline is in Google Docs. Do you know what Google Docs? Do you all know what Google Docs are? It's free because that way it exists online. You can get it from an iPad, from any computer. You can share it with a friend who's going to hold you accountable. Accountability is really, really key. Let me come back to it in a minute because I want to actually go through a little bit more. Okay. So you see how now her third item under June 26 is to set up a meeting with her advisor. So part of what you're doing in the timeline is you're anticipating, wait, I need to meet with my advisor next week. Oh, I better get, so I'm going to have to plan setting that up this week. Okay. If you need to get IRB turned in by a certain time, Go through the IRB form. Figure out what are all the sections. Let's pretend there's six. I'm making this up. But let's pretend there's six sections. Plan in the timeline. Draft section one. Draft section two. By which dates. Then you plan separate time to revise them. It makes it much more strategic and systematic for you. Okay, by July 3rd. I'm, by the way, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I just want to give you a highlight tour. She says by July 3rd, she's going to have discussed the IRB process and potential committee members with her advisor. She'll have received feedback from her advisor. Now, she has made an agreement with her advisor because of her situation, and he's going to give her feedback always in a week turnaround time. You may not be able to even come close to securing that agreement. You have to work within the limits of what you can get from your advisor. She says, I'm going to create a draft of the model to be tested and draft the purpose of the study. She's going to have that written. So those are her goals, that by July 3rd, she wants those things done. By July 10th, she knows she's going to be moving into writing a section on maternal depression and child adolescent depression, okay? So she says, hmm, if I want to write that this week, I better get the articles early in the week. And then I need to read those articles. And I need to meet with Dr. Caldwell to talk about having this person on my committee. I need to confirm that Dr. Suddy is going to be on my committee. And I need to revise my model and the purpose of the study uh, and then give it to my advisor for feedback. So she's thinking it through step by step. Now, the truth is, you may not move this quickly, and you don't need to. But you want to, at, at a minimum, even if you don't timeline beyond a week, start to think about what do I want to accomplish by the end of this week. If you, if you feel like you have no capacity to gauge what's realistic, ask a friend, another graduate student, if they can help you gauge what's realistic. The other thing is, 
practice. Keep planning for a while, and eventually your gauge for understanding what's realistic for you will get better over time. Don't get demoralized or discouraged if in the beginning you keep planning too much. That the tendency is to keep believing that we can do more than we can. It's just like when you go to the buffet and you believe you can eat more than you really can eat. You know how your eyes are really big? And you put all that food on your plate and you think, what was I thinking? Right? We do the same thing here. We have this fantasy of, I'm going to work all weekend. I'm going to work all night. Oh, I'm just going to get up really early. Come on. Who set their alarm to get up at 6 a.m. and work recently? Yes? And then, and then what time did you actually get up? 8, 11? Right. Right. If you're not a morning person and you're not going to get up and work, stop pretending. Don't set your alarm. Why don't you just let yourself sleep? And for those of you who are the snoozers, you, know, you snooze for like an hour and a half. I Really. I'm going to be your mother for a minute. Why don't you just sleep? Really. That is... You're, you're, you're not actually really sleeping during that time. You're making yourself miserable. Just sleep. Then get up and work when it actually works for you. Some of you are night owls. Now, I know some of you are getting into a really bad cycle of staying up really late because you're procrastinating and putting off the work. So we, we've got to address the procrastination, and we're going to get to that. Okay? So anyway, you can, you can travel along here. Um, let's, just go to, let's just turn to the next page just to look randomly. Let's look at uh, by September 4th. Okay, so she says... By the fourth, I'm going to have written the section on the development of sexual behavior in adolescence. I'm going to read about structural equation modeling and regression models to determine what kind of analyses are most appropriate. And email Dr. Caldwell, that's the statistician on our committee. I'm going to, I, ideas for my analysis are going to be sketched out on paper. Now, really, that's a draft. And I'm going to outline section on relationship between depression and sexual risk taking. You see how she's being specific. This is a demanding timeline, but this woman had to get moving. But the odds of her moving are so much better because now she can see the dominoes, right? The domino effect. That if I don't meet this week's goals, I can see how the whole timeline is going to start to fall down. So put the Google Doc, uh, put this plan into Google Docs. Share it with a friend. Hold each other accountable. You need accountability and support. I don't mean yelling at each other, but I mean really having like a weekly meeting could be by phone or Skype, where you actually check in and say, "Do you have a plan? Let me, let's let's go through your plan." can make a huge difference to you if you have somebody who's actually supporting you where you feel like, uh, you know, I have to work. You know, uh, some of you in the room have been on Weight Watchers. Do you know what the secret of Weight Watchers is? It's not the points or whatever the system is. It's having a woman peer over her glasses every Monday morning and see how much you weigh. That's what makes that diet work. I'm serious. Some of you have done Weight Watchers and you've lost weight and then six weeks in you go, I don't really want to pay the monthly fee, the weekly fee anymore. I'm just going to do it on my own. Well, how did that work out for you? Because you don't have somebody looking. For most of us, without the accountability, especially when we're still struggling to work through these issues, we won't keep working. Okay? Now, turn to page 8. Okay. This is the really, really key piece of the structure. Day-to-day okay? -to -day management, an action plan that tells you what are you doing each day? And I encourage you to be as specific as possible. Okay? For example, if you're in class from 3 to 4.30, don't pretend you're going to start working on your dissertation at 4.30 because you're not. You're not going to start working on it probably till 6 or whatever is realistic for you. So mark out blocks of time in your day. Get a plan so that when you wake up in the morning, that pool is so nice and warm, you know exactly what you need to do. You've got the articles laying out. You've got the file maybe open on your computer. You put your phone away. Right, you're ready to go. So see here, she's got two goals for the week. She wants to get this lit review section on parental control and depression, and she wants to get her internship letters requesting applications written and mailed. Now, the second task is not a dissertation task, but she's got to do it. So you can manage and plan anything you want. So you can see the breakdown here. On Monday, she's going to go to yoga. So you can put your workout schedule in here, whatever you need to manage for yourself. She says, I'm going to read and write summaries of the following three articles. Do you see how specific that is? There's no ambiguity about what she should do with her energy in that day. If you just started doing this, if you don't remember anything else I talk about today, but you just started giving yourself the gift of clear instructions the next day of what to do, you would be so much better off. Because now you can free your energy up to read the articles and learn, which is why you're here, instead of being caught in that procrastination mode and being paralyzed with what should I do next. A lot of times students will say to me, 
Someone just, by the way, one of my clients said this to me today. I don't know. I mean, she's a brand new client. Should I really spend all this time planning when I could just be working? Well, if, if that was the case, we wouldn't be on the phone, right? Um, the time you spend being a project manager will pay off big time for you, especially as you practice and get better at it. Okay, now notice on Tuesday she's got to work at a university hospital. So she's being honest. I have to work from 8 in the morning till 6 p.m. I'm only going to read and write summaries of two articles. She deliberately picked two easier articles. So when you make your list of all of your articles, grade them. Easy, medium, hard. Don't plan to read six hard, dense, 50-page articles on the same day. Be humane. Mix it up a little bit. Let yourself read some of the easier articles. If an article is really dense and challenging, break it up. You could say, I'm going to read 10 pages now, 10 pages then. Ten, you can, it's, you're in charge of the semantics, and the semantics are very, very powerful. Um, okay, then you can see on Wednesday she's going to go to this uh, conference. She's going to write a rough draft of the parental control and depression based on the five articles she's already read, work on the internship letters. Thursday she's going to read four more articles, go to yoga. Friday she's back to the conference, read a couple more articles, customize the letters. Saturday she's going to integrate the new literature she read Thursday and Sunday into this parental control section. It should say uh, Thursday and Friday, actually. And she's going to make a list of points that might still be missing, conduct another lit search if she needs to, on and on and on. Now, the thing is, is that all the work that's laid out here, aside from the yoga, adds up to her meeting the goals at the top. So she's being very systematic and strategic and setting herself up for greater su success where the pool is actually warm. Okay? Now, let me give you another quick little metaphor about planning, and then I want to end by talking about overcoming some of the psychological barriers. Okay, you, uh, you've, you've all seen a gas stove, correct? A gas burner? When you go to the stove, it's in the off position. There's no flame. When you first turn it on, it comes on that high flame, right? A lot of times in graduate school, we act as if we only have two choices when it comes to productivity, off or high flame. Now, if I was going to, you came over to my house and I cooked you dinner, and I only used off or high flame, you probably would not come back for dinner. I would be a terrible cook, right? So high flame, by the way, is useful. If you want to boil water for pasta real quick or sear the outside of a piece of fish, high flame, great. But if I would like that fish to actually be cooked all the way through and not burned on the outside, or I want my pasta to actually cook without the water boiling over and putting out the flame, I better turn it down. See, there's a whole world between off and high flame. Where you're going to optimally learn and have the capacity to sustain the energy and the motivation you need day to day to do this is in between. And there are going to be times where you need to go down to a simmer because you're not well, you're struggling, there's a crisis in your family, something's going on. And there are times when you've got a deadline and you need to knock it back up closer to high flame. But I want you to be conscious of human beings do not function well on high flame all the time. That's how they get sick and burn out, right? Now, when we have a, f a fixed mindset and we're all about performing and looking good, we tend to go with the high flame because we think that's how we're going to survive and we're going to make it. I'll just work really, really hard, right? So if you, by the way, if you've been procrastinating lately, here's what I think I've been in your mind. By the way, I've been in your apartment and your mind. This is what the graduate student mind does. It says, oh, God, you have been totally wasting time. You've gotten nothing done. Oh, I know what to do. I'll just expect you to do a lot of really high quality work in a very short amount of time. <laughs> Genius! So the very strategy that you employ to pull yourself out of a period of procrastination becomes the reason you continue to procrastinate. Because the standards and expectations for the quality and quantity of work are totally in unreasonable. They're inhumane. You can't accomplish them. So if you've been procrastinating a lot, the answer is not to work all weekend and work round the clock and really, really hard because you're probably not going to. The answer is find a friend, sit down, make a plan, get it broken down into very small pieces, and then work on it. Now, okay, let's talk about the tomatoes real quick. Okay, there's a website. It's called mytomatoes.com. You can email me and I'll tell it to you. It's an online timer. You sign in. Every time you sign in, it will have a list of all of the tomatoes you've ever completed. A tomato equals 25 minutes. Here's the idea. You choose to say, for the next 25 minutes, I am going to put blinders on. I am only reading this article. I am not checking my email. I am not answering the phone. I am not going to CNN.com. I am not turning on the television. I am not making a cup of tea. I am just reading this article. It's only 25 minutes. Then the buzzer goes off. 
and a little three zeros appear on the screen. You click on the zeros and a little box magically appears. And you write, read article by you know, Strauss and Jones. And, you hit, and it gives you a five minute break. If you need a longer break, you can take one, but it gives you a five minute break. Buzzer goes off at the end of five minutes. You click start tomato. I am only reading this article. I am not checking my email. So it's a way of creating boundaries for 25 minutes. Listen, you cannot fully learn if you're constantly in all of these things, okay? Now, here's the thing about the human brain. It's constantly chattering at you, chattering, 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 chattering all the time. Some of your brains are chattering right now. And by the way, you've had all kinds of opinions and evaluations about me while I'm standing up here. Thank you for sharing. I don't really care. No, I do, in a way. I mean, like a part of me does care, but what can I do about it? You're, we're, we're constantly chattering, 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 chattering all the time, evaluating. Now, we did a little bit, we kind of got into this a little bit when you were asking the question about something happens, and then our minds say something else, okay? So... When I first did dissertation workshops, I used to hand out little pieces of paper to the whole entire audience, like post-it notes. And I would have them write down the most common negative recurring thoughts they were having that they felt were interfering with their graduate student experience. And I would collect them all and I would read them back. And the interesting thing was, no matter what, if I was at Northwestern, University of Chicago, University of Illinois, DePaul, Loyola, it didn't matter where I went, they were the same. I mean, literally, they said the identical things over many years. And so when I wrote the book, I collated them, and I kind of categorized them in, you know, in, in themes, and I want to share some of them with you. Because part of being a graduate student means that for the vast majority of us, we're going to have negative thoughts during the process. Okay, see if any of these sound familiar. We already mentioned this one. They made a mistake admitting me in this program. My writing skills are not at the level they need to be. I'm, not, I'm just not capable of finishing. I'm not an original thinker. I lack the knowledge a person should have to deserve a doctorate. I'm, just, I'm not as smart as people think I am. I'll be found out as a fraud eventually. I'm just good at tricking people into thinking I'm smart. Other students seem so intelligent and organized, I don't measure up. Because I struggle with statistics, I constantly question my intelligence and abilities. What if my advisor rips, up my, rips my work to shreds and tells me my work is insufficient to earn a PhD? When I finish my degree, then I'll have to get a job. What if no one will hire me? My dissertation must be perfect. I'm so worried about what other people think of, my, of me in my department. I want to be a perfect student in the eyes of faculty members. I'm too lazy and unmotivated to ever finish a dissertation. I procrastinate too much, and no matter what I do, I can't seem to do what I promise I say I will do. I can't get myself to do any meaningful work unless I have an entire day to work. I haven't talked to my chairperson in so long, I'm afraid to call or email for fear he will tell me to get a new chairperson. My advisor is so critical that I'm reluctant to give him the latest version of my dissertation. Right? So it sounds familiar? So it doesn't matter. We, and, but these are the things that go on in our heads. So when you're procrastinating, do you ever say, God, you're lazy. You're so lazy. Why can't you motivate yourself? Yeah? You're not lazy. Do you know what you're afraid? Right? I don't really... Th lazy implies an apathy towards action. Okay, there might be moments where you're apathetic. But what I actually think more often than not is that you're afraid that something's charged about the work. Of course, boy, if you've been so focused on performing and looking good and competing, well, and your worth is mixed up in your performance, you've got a lot on the line. When we're procrastinating, it's, listen to me very clearly, it is not the work we are avoiding. It is not the work you are avoiding. What you are avoiding are your thoughts and feelings about the work. Okay? So if I sit down to work and I think, oh, this is so hard, I'm really struggling, I just feel so stupid. Do you think I'm excited about hanging out with that piece of work right there? No, I'd rather go get a Diet Coke, right? I want to get up, I want to move away, I want to resist it. So any time in life you're not taking action in your life in areas that are important to you, could be in health and well-being, could be in relationships, could be in your doctoral work. It's because there's thoughts, feelings, physiological experiences that are going on inside you. It's called the private experience of being human. See, we compare our insides to other people's outsides all the time. Some of you, by the way, have thought, man, I could never get up and speak like that. Have you, some of you thought that, right? There are a lot of things that you do I could not do. If I knew what you do, I, I happen to be able to get up in front of a room and talk without notes and go on and on and on like I am. But that does not mean that I don't have issues or problems <laughs> or struggles. 
because I do, right? That does not mean, listen, the other day, my friend, we were at a restaurant, and she said, okay, so the bill is this amount of money, okay, all right, you're the doctor, what tip should we leave? And I said, have you not met me? If you give me a calculator, I can figure it out. Like, I, my, I have, like, just, I have not been practicing my math skills. And so they have, they have departed. They have left me. Now, I could probably get them back, but it's just at this time in my life doesn't feel important to me. Right? But what we do is we constantly compare. So people often, I'm saying, giving myself as an example, because people always tell me, you seem so confident, you seem so articulate, you have it all together. And so from your vantage point, you could make a comparison to me or to a classmate or to someone else because you know what goes on inside yourself. You know about the self-doubt and the worry and the concern. So you, f you seem inadequate in comparison. But the C inside other people is much more like you than it is different. Okay, so remember that. When you have negative thoughts, like, I can't believe how long this is taking me. By the way, your negative thoughts could just be as innocuous as, I hate this. This is boring. Why did I sign up for this deal? How many more years till I get out of here? I mean, they don't have to be soul-searing thoughts but they're thoughts that are unpleasant and that you move away from. They create all kinds of negative emotions like anxiety, fear, depression, anger, frustration. And we don't like to feel those things. Most of us have developed this relationship with negative emotions like, oh, I can't feel that. I don't want to experience that. By the way, that's what addiction is all about. Addiction, whether you're addicted to a drugs and alcohol or you're addicted to your iPhone, right? It's about constantly getting that hit, that stimulation, so that we don't have to feel what's actually there. It is a profound transformation and shift in a human being's life when they learn to be aware of thoughts and feelings as they are occurring. Right? This is what Buddhism is all about, by the way. That we actually learn to say, oh, fear is here, like a visitor who's shown up at my door. Well, hello, fear. I was expecting you. Welcome. <laughs> Have a seat. I'll serve you some tea, but I'm going to go work on my dissertation. Okay? But you're going to have the experience of negative thoughts, feelings in your in your day-to-day -day experience in life that create all kinds of reactivity. And by the way, procrastination is a form of reactivity. Procrastination and perfectionism are actually both forms of something called experiential avoidance. Experiential avoidance is a term coined by Stephen Hayes, who has done a tremendous amount of uh, clinical practice and uh, pretty amazing research on a clinical intervention called acceptance and commitment therapy. He's out of uh, University of Nevada at Las Vegas and he's another person whose work I think is really relevant to the quality of our lives. Um, experiential avoidance is any time we actively avoid making contact with thoughts and feelings or physiological experiences or memories that are unpleasant or difficult for us. And so we take flight into internet talking on the phone, watching television, eating, whatever it is for us. We take flight away from things we don't like to experience, and so we avoid. Uh, perfectionism is the illusion that if I could be perfect enough, I can avoid negative outcomes and having to have negative things. That I can somehow rise up to a level where I will be above criticism. But why do you care about criticism? The reason you don't want to be criticized isn't because the criticism is a problem. You're afraid of how you're going to feel when you're criticized. So a lot of you, by the way, are afraid of things that aren't, haven't even happened. You're living every day in fear of criticism of an imagined negative feeling state that might happen if you're criticized. And that's why if you learn what I was talking about earlier, to hear the words that are be si being said and be very curious about them, then you can free yourself up to learn and not be so afraid of potential future negative feedback. Um, so I'm going to give you another quick metaphor. Okay, so I don't, I don't know why well, I was talking about being hit by a bus earlier, but have you actually been on the city bus at some point? You've been on a bus? Okay. So when you get on a bus, there's a bus driver. The bus driver might be driving, I don't know. I saw a bus maybe coming down, was it 34th, 32nd? I don't know what street, but driving down the street. On the bus, people get on the bus, they get off the bus, they get on the bus, they get off the bus. It's kind of boring. That's pretty much all that happens all day. Most of the passengers who get on the bus are neutral, normal. They get on, they get off, no problem. But sometimes there are passengers who are difficult and unwanted, correct? On the phone, eating, talking, soliciting, arguing, haven't bathed in a long time, got something going on that's undesirable, correct? Now, the thing is, if the bus driver wants to keep driving the bus towards the destination, you kind of just got to make space for those unpleasant passengers and just kind of let them be. They'll get off the bus eventually. Well, that's a lot like life. So let's just imagine that you are driving this bus towards the direction of getting a PhD or master's. 
And down the street, the blinking light calling you are your values, your larger aspirations of how you're going to serve the world and innovate and create and express yourself and make a difference. Calling you, saying, come on, over here, let's drive in this direction. But what happens when you wake up in the morning, even with your lovely timeline that you made and you've got your action plan, which will help, but nonetheless, sometimes unwanted passengers get on the bus and they say, you're really not that smart. I don't think you can do it. Why is this taking you so long? Now your dissertation really has to be incredible because people are wondering what you've been doing. So you hear the voices of those passengers. You feel the anxiety and the tightness in your chest and the pit in your stomach. And what happens to us is that we get hijacked as the bus driver by those passengers that get on the bus. And we, we turn around. We get involved with them. We try to get rid of them and push them off the bus. But if I get out of my seat as the bus driver and I go back and start trying to get rid of those negative thoughts and feelings, am I driving the bus? No. So the reality is, is that if you want to move forward and you want to procrastinate less, you want to be less perfectionistic, you want to have the courage to move forward and do what you really did, what you really are here for, which is to learn, you have to be willing to one tomato at a time, okay? Make it that small for yourself. Make it, or some of my clients do the cherry tomato, where they call it 10 minutes. You can download apps on your phone. I hesitate to give this advice, but there are, there, if you look up Pomodoro, which is a tomato in Italian, um, I like Pomodoro Pro because you can set the tomato to a unit of time other than 25 minutes and you can do cherry tomatoes. But if you can have the courage for a cherry or full tomato, okay, to, what is it going to sound like when they edit this down and I'm talking about tomatoes? They're going to think I'm a crazy lady. But have the courage to step forward and drive the bus in the direction of your values for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, for 25 minutes, whatever the unit of time is, following your plan, having that structure there to support you, in the presence of thoughts, feelings, physiology that's uncomfortable for you. This has the power to transform the way you live your life. Because who is in charge of your life? You or your thoughts and feelings? It's good to check yourself on that one, okay? Some of you have been trying to lose weight, correct? In this room, there's a few of you who have been trying to lose weight at some point or get more fit and healthy. So you, you, know, how you, you know how you have like a grand plan and you're all committed and you have this vision of what you're going to do to take care of yourself? And then this passenger gets on the bus that says, ooh, that donut looks good, right? Imagine that you're so clear on this aspiration to live a long, healthy, vital life that you have the courage to say, I'm allowed to have the desire for the donut, be on the bus, have a seat. I'm still going to drive in the direction of health and vitality. It's one choice at a time. Sometimes those passengers are really difficult to deal with. They get you at knife point, right? Sometimes we get into a state in graduate school where the amount of depression and anxiety is so great that no matter what we do, we don't know how to drive with the presence of them. And if that's happening to you, and it does happen to graduate students, I really encourage you. I don't, I'm actually am not familiar with the resources that are on this campus, but I'm assuming that there is a counseling center and there are services. I really encourage you. Sometimes we need medication. Sometimes we need talk therapy. Sometimes we need a support group. We need friendship. We need community around us to help us because those voices can get very loud at times in our lives. And we need ways to be able to support ourselves to move forward when that's happening. Okay? Um, I want to also just mention to you something that I think is really, really important is to remember that you have a guide here and that's called committee and advisor. And while it would be lovely if your advisor drove the relationship and took responsibility for setting up meetings and sent you emails and tracked you to see how you were doing, they probably won't. You are in charge and you want to remember that they are a person of power relative to you. I don't want you to fear them, I want you to respect them. And I want you to know that sometimes you might have gotten matched with an advisor where they have a particular style that's an issue for you. It's their style. Don't take it so personally. Get support. But keep communicating with them. If your advisor doesn't hear from you for long periods of time, they're going to be less invested in you. They don't know what's going on. Update them. Give them reports. Tell them what's going on. When you show up to a meeting with your advisor, show up with questions, showing you've had thought. See, 
if a faculty member comes to a meeting with a student and the student says, well, I just don't know what to do here. I'm stuck. You got any ideas? That is a very frustrating meeting for that advisor. Versus if you come to that meeting and you say, you know, I'm struggling with this. I've really been thinking about it. I have a couple of directions I'm thinking about pursuing. I'd like to get your input. That gives the advisor the sense of action and direction, this thought. They're more invested, they're more excited about what you're doing. So it's just really important for you to take responsibility for managing that relationship and knowing that sometimes advisors do forget about you, right? Uh, that, that they have a lot on their plate. And it's up to you to keep putting yourself on their radar and to remember it's a relationship. It needs care and attention. And you, for the most part, are probably going to be the primary driver in that relationship. If you are really extremely challenged in the relationship, get support. You know, talk with other people. Find out what your options are. There are occasionally times where a student and an advisor are very poorly matched and it is too arduous a road for a student to continue with that advisor. And there are times when you are best served to change. But most of the time, I think the issues can be resolved. And remember, your advisor is someone to learn from. And also seek input, have meetings, have conversations with other people. There are so many amazing minds on this campus that you can learn from if you're willing to put yourself out there, okay? So I just want to remind you, kind of um, go over the few things that we talked about today. The first thing is pay attention to your mindset. Pay attention to, uh, like, you know, if you eat a lot of junk food, how you start to feel bad, right? If you, if you fuel yourself on a diet of negative thoughts and negative conversations and competition and comparing yourself, you won't feel very good in the program. Keep reminding yourself, I'm here to learn, and I'm allowed to not know, and I'm allowed to make mistakes. And wake up that compassionate cheerleader, that voice inside yourself that keeps giving you instructions and keeps getting you back on the field no matter how many times you mess up. Give yourself permission to be a beginner, to be willing to write a baby draft and to not know. The second thing is really try to use some kind of project management approach. Get some accountability. Break things down. At a minimum, clarify for yourself, what am I doing tomorrow? What's my start time? Uh, definitely this week, try the tomatoes. They, they can be kind of a miracle. Okay, and I want to just give you one quick metaphor before we end. Um, in order to be able to drive that bus in the direction you want to go, now I'm going to mix metaphors, okay? And do what you really are here to do, which is to learn and keep moving and keep going. You have a lot competing for your attention, don't you? You have a lot of things going on, a lot of roles and responsibilities that, you've, that you're managing. And I know how easy it can be to um, keep doing the things in your life that are urgent and important. So in life, there are tasks that are urgent and important, right? Things you need to do for your research job. Right? You have to get those emails returned. You need to call back this person. You need to have groceries in the house. You need to pay your, pay your bills. Right? Constantly screaming at you to do them. The problem for most of us is that our dissertation is urgent. I'm sorry, it's not urgent. And it's important. Right? Usually things that are connected to our values, the big ticket items in our life. So for example, your health and well-being. Today, if you eat donuts for breakfast, it's not the end of the world. Right? If you don't work on your dissertation, okay. But over time, if you keep neglecting your health and well-being, eventually it will become urgent. If you keep procrastinating, eventually you're going to have a consequence, which means USC will kick you out because you didn't perform in a certain amount of time. In order to be able to thrive and prosper at USC, you have to be willing to do the things sometimes that are not urgent but important, even though the urgent and important tasks are screaming at you for their attention. So, do you remember in 2007 there was a massive, massive fire in San Diego? Like burned out hundreds of thousands of acres. Do you know what was a significant reason that fire got so out of control? It was because 100, over 100 years ago the National Forest Service enacted a policy that said put out all forest fires. So every time there was a fire, put it out, put it out, put it out, right? All around. So eventually a massive amount of fuel built up in the forest because they weren't allowing fires to burn off some of the foliage and dead and dying trees and small brush. So when we had high winds and drought and all of that fuel combined together, we had an awesome fire that the Forest Service could literally not get around fast enough, and the fire was devastating. This is what happens to human beings when we are firefighters and are like, oh, check my email, oh, call this person back, oh, do this. When we're constantly being firefighters and we don't ever let small fires burn, 
we can never get to the big t ticket items in our life. And eventually, we have a massive fire in our life, and we know what goes up in smoke? Your values and your goals that are connected to them. So when I wrote the dissertation book, and I was running a business, I had two young kids, and my life was crazy, I would walk from my house to the coffee shop, and I would say to myself, it's okay, you're going to let your email burn. And you're going to let your email burn for the next two hours for the greater good of finishing this book. So put your phones down. Close down Facebook. Shut off the internet. You can use the, you know, set a timer if you're not allowed to have the internet for the tomatoes. 25 minutes. In 25 minutes, can you let all the other fires burn in your, burn in your life and give yourself over to your work and to learning and expanding your mind? And if you can do that, practice that over time, you're going to have a much, much better experience in graduate school. Um, please let me know after this workshop. If you have questions for me, you please feel free to email me or call me. Um, if you want to stay afterwards and ask me some specific questions that are relevant to you, I'll hang out for a little bit. You might need to clear out of this room. I don't know what's happening afterwards. And thank you so much. It's really great to be around a group of graduate students.